Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And today we have Juanma from University of Santiago de Compostela, who will talk about this is the first talk in the cycle of three talks of um, on symmetric spaces of non compact type. And Juanma is going to introduce them and talk about the Cartan and US Abadi compositions. So, yeah, ready you. when you are. Thank you for the introduction and for everyone for coming into this to this talk. As Ivan said, there uh, from this week on, we are going to have three three talks given by Ivan, by Tomas, and I, in which we will uh, delve into the algebraic methods used in dealing with symmetric spaces of non-compact type. So, uh, as for as for me, I'm going to talk about two decompositions, which are the most important for isometry algebras in symmetric spaces of non-compact type. The first is the Cartan decomposition, which allows us to translate every geometric element of a symmetric space into Lie theoretic terms. And secondly, we are going to deal with the Iwasawa decomposition, which can serve as a sort of Gram-Schmidt process for isometries of a non-compact symmetric space. So just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, I'm going to briefly recall what a symmetric space is. So let them be any connected Riemannian manifold. We say that M is a symmetric space if every point O admits a symmetry, uh, sorry, an isometry SO that fixes this point and acts on the standing space as minus the identity map. So since, the, since an isometry is determined by its value at a point and the differential of its value, it can be shown that this, that this isometry is unique and it's also an involution. So SO squared is the identity. So we call this the geodesic symmetry. Also, uh, from uh, the fact that this symmetry reverses the geodesics around the point O means that it must be an isolated fixed point, which is useful in, <clears throat> in some proofs. So well, this space is uh, verify some nice properties. Firstly, they are complete, because if we take any geodesic gamma in an interval 0t, then we can take any point that is, half, that is past the midpoint, and we can use the real geodesic reflection at that point to make an extension of our geodesic past time t. So we can do this indefinitely in order to extend the geodesic to the real numbers. Furthermore, we can show that symmetric spaces are homogeneous in the sense that if we have two points p and q, there is always an isometry sending p to q. So to do this, simply take two points, connect them by uh, minimizing geodesic, and take the geodesic symmetry at the midpoint. And it would send p to q at q to q. All right. So our intention here is to try to extract algebraic information from the symmetric space that is just enough for us to be able to reconstruct symmetric spaces from this data. And this is done by means of symmetric pairs. So if we start with a symmetric space and we fix a point O, which we understand as the origin or the base point, there is a natural group, a natural D group that is associated to the space, which is the isometry group. So by the Myers-Steinroth theorem, this is always on the group. And because of homogeneity, it must act transitively. And therefore, the same is true for its identity component. So we're choosing the identity component of the isometry group. It also acts transitively. And so we can express the manifold M as the quotient space G mod K, where K is the subgroup of all the isometries in G that fix the origin. This is proven to be a compact subgroup. So this is the information that we get from the fact that M is homogeneous. But furthermore, the geodesic symmetry induces an involution of G sigma, which is simply the conjugation by the geodesic symmetry. Notice that even though this is a conjugation, I don't need to put the superscript minus one because the geodesic reflection is um, <clears throat> an involution. And as I said earlier, the point O is going to be an isolated fixed point of its own symmetry. So as a consequence, K must sit somewhere in between the set of fixed points of the involution and the identity component of this set. So in particular, these are two Lie subgroups, and they must have the same Lie algebra because of these inclusions. So we're going to take these algebraic properties and we promote them to a definition. We will say that a symmetric pair is a triple G K sigma, such that G is a connected Lie group and K is a compact subgroup. And the involution sigma must be <coughs> such that the subgroup K it is somewhere in between the fixed point set of sigma and its identity component. We will also make a third technical, impose a third technical condition, which is that the action of G over the homogeneous space G mod K is almost effective. So this means that there is only a finite amount of elements of G that 
represent the identity map. So in the case above, the only element that fits this description is the identity map. So there is no there is no loss of information here. So the natural question now is to try to understand if a symmetric pair determines a symmetric space. And the answer is affirmative. So now let's start from a symmetric pair. We construct the homogeneous manifold G mod K, and we fix the concept of the identity as the origin of the space. Then the fact that sigma is a lead group involution means that if we take the derivative of sigma and call it theta, then it must be a Lie algebra involution of the Lie algebra of G. So in particular, this must be a linear map whose square is one. And therefore from linear algebra, we know that there is a decomposition of the Lie algebra G as the sum of the eigenspaces for theta with eigenvalues one and minus one. This first eigenspace is nothing more than the set of fixed points of theta, which in turn has to be the Lie algebra of the set of fixed points of sigma. But we know from earlier that this is the isotropy algebra. So in the end, we can replace this decomposition as the decomposition of G equals K plus P, where K is isotropy algebra, and P for now is simply a vector subspace. But more than being a vector subspace, we can identify this, this space P with the tangent space of N at the identity. And this is done by means of fundamental vector fields. Remember that when you have a Lie group acting on a manifold, the elements of the group represent different diffeomorphisms, but also the elements of the Lie algebra are going to represent infinitesimal transformations or vector fields. So these are the fundamental vector fields. They are defined as follows. You simply take any element of the Lie algebra X and you define the vector field X star by the following formula, where here EXP is the Lie exponential map. By the definition, uh, this vector field is such that the flow is precisely the multiplication by the one parameter group generated by X. And well, since <clears throat> evaluating at the origin is the same as taking the differential of the projection, whose kernel is K, it follows that the map that takes the elements of P into their fundamental vector fields evaluated at the origin must be a vector space isomorphism. So with this, we can make a we can identify P with TOM, and for now we're going to treat them as equal. If you know a little bit about reductive homogeneous spaces, you'll be glad to know that this is a reductive decomposition. So at K acts, at K preserves the vector space P. But well, for now we have this vector space decomposition on a homogeneous space, but we don't know still if M is a Riemannian manifold or much less a symmetric space. So it turns out that as long as we put a G invariant metric, we don't care which one it is, M is always going to be a symmetric space. And these metrics exist because of the compactness of K. This is because we could try to define the geodesic symmetry at the origin by using the map that takes the coset GK to sigma GK. This is clearly a diffeomorphism and an involution. But if we take a closer look, we can try to look at the differential at the tangent space of the origin. And this is nothing more than theta. It's a differential of sigma. But the tangent space is p. So therefore, <clears throat> the differential must be minus the identity map. Right? So at the very least, it's an isometry in the tangent space GOM. And by using the translations, one proves that this is a global isometry. Right? So to summarize, we have developed a process that allows us to go from geometry to algebra by taking a symmetric space and constructing an associated symmetric pair. And we have constructed a sort of converse um, process in which we take a symmetric pair and we develop a symmetric space out of it. One could think that these processes are inverse. But in reality, if we try to construct a, a symmetric space from the symmetric pair and we represent it as G mod K, the G might be smaller than the connected component of the identity, sorry, of the isometry group. So with this, with this algebra to geometry process, it may be the case that we are losing isometries, but still it's usually enough for us to work with. So well, now that we have this dictionary between algebra and geometry, we can be ready to state what the Cartan decomposition and the Cartan evolution are. So if we take the, our symmetric space, the Cartan decomposition is going to be nothing more than this vector space decomposition of G as the sum of the eigenspaces of theta. And the map theta is known as the Cartan involution. So just as a word of warning, some authors prefer to reserve the terminology of Cartan decomposition and Cartan involution 
for symmetric spaces of the non-compact type, mainly to be coherent with the theory of semi-simple groups, because if there you are going to find a, 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 <clears throat> another decomposition, another involution, which make the role of the Cartagena decomposition and the Cartagena involution, and they're essentially the same. But for us, everything is going to be called Cartagena decomposition and Cartagena involution. There are these three bracket relations that are very simple to check between k and p. So k times k is in k. This is simply because k is a subalgebra. k times p is contained in p, and p times p is contained in k. There is also a sort of converse of these properties in the sense that if we have a decomposition of the Lie algebra as a sum of k and p with these properties, then there is a unique involution whose eigenspaces are k and p. So well, the first thing that I wanted to do uh, now that we have the Cartan decomposition is to try to express the geometric information of the symmetric space in terms of the in terms of it. So by that, by this I mean the connection and the curvature. To determine the connection, uh, ironically, it's easier to determine first the geodesics and then to try to derive the geodesics with so the connection. So <clears throat> we have the following proposition that states that if we have any element of the tangent space, which is P, then the geodesic generated by the element X must be the one parameter subgroup generated by X evaluated at the origin. The simplest proof that I know, that I know of relies in the theory of the Riemannian submersions. And the idea is to take the canonical map that takes elements of G and evaluates them at all, and to try to convert it to a Riemannian submersion. So M is already a Riemannian manifold, but a priori, G does not have any type of Riemannian structure. So to give it one, we remember that P has an inner product, which is the one inherited from the manifold. We choose any inner product on K, and now we make an inner product on the Lie algebra G, so by declaring that K and P are, not, are orthogonal. So this gives us an inner product on the Lie algebra, which is the same as giving a left invariant metric in the Lie group G. And with this, with this metric, it's very easy to see that phi is a Riemannian submersion. It's also defined so that the elements of K are vertical vector fields, so they are tangent to the fibers of phi, while the elements of P are horizontal vector fields, so they are orthogonal to the fibers of phi. So well, the main result we need now to prove uh, that these are geodesics is the fact that pi carries horizontal geodesics of G into geodesics of M. So in the end, we only need to check if the one parameter subgroup here is a horizontal geodesic. But for this, we simply need to use the Gossel formula. If we, simply, if we take two elements of P and we use the Gossel formula, we know that the levi civita connection will be given by these six summons where C is any vector field, and we may assume that it's a vector field in, in the Lie algebra. If we take a closer look, these three first terms are going to vanish because the inner product and the vector fields are invariant. And by using the bracket relations I put before, the fifth and the sixth term are going to vanish as well. So in the end, we are left <coughs> with this expression. So in reality, the covariant derivative and the Lie derivative are going to differ by a factor of two. So in particular, if we take y equal to x, the covariant derivative is going to be equal to zero. Because of this, the one parameter subgroup is going to be a, a geodesic. And therefore, when we evaluate it at the origin, this gives us the m geodesics of the manifold. And now from this expression, we're going to derive the connection. Well, it turns out that, it's that <clears throat> at the origin, the covariant derivative and the lead derivative are going to be the same. So the covariant derivative of y with respect to x is the bracket of x star and y. So to prove it, we now take the, the left multiplication by the one parameter subgroup determined by x. And since we know that the geodesics are the one parameter subgroups, we know that this map is going to take the geodesic generated by x and it's going to translate it in t units, right? But uh, furthermore, since we know the expression of the geodesic symmetries, one can check that this left multiplication can be expressed as the composition of two symmetries, the symmetry at the origin with the symmetry at the point in the geodesic corresponding to T halves. And from this expression, one proves that the, the, <clears throat> the differential of this map must be the parallel transport in T units. Right? And then we simply derive the connection from this, from this last expression. You know, the, <clears throat> 
we simply remember that to compute the covariant derivative of y with respect to x, we take the values of y along the curve x dx, we parallel translate those values into the origin by using this map, and this gives us a curve in P whose differential is going to be precisely the covariant derivative. We simply substitute here the left multiplication with, sorry, the, the T sub T with the left multiplication, and we may now recognize this expression as a lead derivative, because as I said earlier, the left multiplication by the one parameter subgroup is precisely the flow of X star. So in the end, the covariant derivative is equal to the lead derivative. So the key fact here uh, when deriving the connection is that we didn't need to make any further hypothesis on the metric more than that it's a left invariant. So in the future, uh, we may be able to, <clears throat> to change our metric to, to better suit our needs. And we know that the affine structure of N is going to remain unchanged. Okay. So as a consequence of the formula for the connection, one can derive directly or by using Riemannian submersions and the curvature tensor, which I've just put here so that we all have the same time for this hour, is given by the triple bracket operation. So R of X, Y, C is, the, is minus the triple bracket. Uh, this last expression allows us to give a, an algebraic characterization of total geodesic submanifolds, which often, which often appear in our problems. And, <clears throat> and this is given by the means of triple systems. So in general Riemannian manifolds, we know that total geodesic submanifolds passing through the origin induce curvature invariant subspaces in the sense that their tangent space must be invariant under this tensor. But since we know the expression of the, of the curvature, this means that that such a subspace must satisfy this algebraic property, which is known as being a triple system. The novel fact about symmetric spaces is that this process is reversible. So a triple system always generates a total geodesic submanifold, having so therefore we have a bijective correspondence. One can go even further and prove that total geodesic submanifolds are flat if and only if the corresponding triple system is abelian. So so far, how are you going? Okay, thanks. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to go a little bit further on the study of symmetric pairs. And then we're going to describe what the type is. So we talked earlier about the like, Euclidean type, compact type, non compact type, but what is exactly the type of a space? Well, if you take any symmetric space and we consider the Cartan decomposition, the vector subspace P has two natural, naturally defined inner in bilinear forms. The first one is simply the inner product that it inherits from M. And the second one is the killing form, as is the bilinear form that takes X and Y to a trace of add X and Y. So this is always a bilinear form, and it can be shown that it's non-degenerate if and only if the algebra G is semi-simple. Well, the sign of the killing form will determine the type of the symmetric space. So the space M is of Euclidean type. If this killing form is zero, and the quintessential example is the Euclidean space. It's of compact type if the <coughs> killing form is negative definite. So some examples include spheres, projective spaces, Osmanians, compact groups with invariant metrics. And uh, <coughs> our, our example of special interest with our symmetric spaces of non-compact type, which are those in which the killing form is positive definite. So some examples are the hyperbolic spaces, or these spaces SLNR mod SON, which represent the sets of all volume preserving inner products on the Euclidean space. As a side note, unless the space is holonomy reducible, it may be the case that our symmetric space is not of any type. So, for example, we may have the product of the Euclidean space with the hyperbolic plane, and this is not finding at these types, right? Another thing that one may notice is that we are only talking about the sign of the killing form in P, but this is because the sign of the killing form in K is already known. In the same way that one shows that the killing form for a compact group is negative definite, one shows that the killing form has to be, ne has to be negative definite of K. So this gives us some consequences for compact and non-compact symmetric spaces. The first one is that the killing form in a compact symmetric space is going to be negative definite because it's negative definite in both K and P. And in particular, the Lie group G must be compact and semi simple. And M being quotient of a compact group must also be a compact manifold. 
And in terms of sectional curvature, the sectional curvature of a compact symmetric space is always uh, greater than or equal to zero. In a sort of dual setting, we have in, in compact symmetric spaces in which the killing form is only negative definite in the Lie algebra K, but globally it's going to be non degenerate. So the group G is still going to be semi simple, but now it's, non, it's a non compact group. And due only to compact spaces, the sectional curvature is now less than or equal to zero. So remember that I said earlier that when you construct a symmetric space from a symmetric pair, it may be the case that you lose isometries. But it turns out that when the group acting on the space is semi simple, then the Lie algebra of the group is going to coincide with the Lie algebra of the isometry group. So <clears throat> this is at the Lie algebra level, and at the Lie group level, we know that G is going to be a finite sheeted covering of the identity component of the isometry group. So this allows, for example, to determine all of the isometries in this subset. Okay, so this is this is everything for general symmetric spaces. And from now on, I'm going to be working only with symmetric spaces of the non-compact type. Okay, so the first thing that I need to do is to change the metric sub. I'm going to first define an inner product on G that is going to be suitable for our nets. And then I'm going to change the metric on M so that it coincides with the killing form, all right? OK, so we define an inner product on the Lie algebra G to be the map that sends x on y to minus p of x comma theta y. So from the definition of theta, it's, it's more or less simple to check that this is an inner product. And if it extends the killing form when restricted to p, it coincides with p, right? <clears throat> and also, since theta is an automorphism of the Lie algebra, one can use these facts to prove that for every element of G, the transpose of its adjoint transformation at x is the same as the opposite of at theta x. So this has some consequences for elements in k and in p. To be more precise, when we have an element in p, say x, where theta x is minus x, and therefore at x is symmetric, and if x is in k, then theta x is equal to x, so at x is skew symmetric. All right. So this is what we do at the Lie algebra level and at the Manifold level, we simply take the metric on M and we normalize it in the way in such a way <clears throat> so that it coincides with the killing form at the tangent space P. So with this new setup that we have for non-compact symmetric spaces, uh, we can prove a lot of facts that are <clears throat> at the basic for non-compact symmetric spaces. I want to prove here that these manifolds are always Hadamard and that the group K is maximal compact. Right? So we first we're first going to prove that M is a Hadamard manifold. Well, this, is, this means that M has to be simply connected of negative curvature and complete. We already know that is everything but simply connected. So we may apply the cartan hadamard theorem to deduce that the exponential map is a covering map. So if this map is injective, it's a diffeomorphism and we are done. So, okay, we take two elements X and Y in P and we assume that they, they have this, their same exponential image. We know that the exponential map coincides with the Lie exponential map, so we simply express <coughs> so we simply express it as a Lie exponential map, or equivalently, we can express it as x x being equal to x y times an element of the isotropy using subgroup k. So now we can apply the adjoint representation, which is <coughs> which I may recall that it commutes with the exponential map, and therefore the exponential of at x must be equal to the exponential of at y times at k. This last equation might not seem like it's extremely useful, but if we take a closer look at it, it turns out that this gives us two polar decompositions of an operator. So since at x and at y are symmetric because x and y are in p and at k is an orthogonal transformation, these two, <coughs> these two, okay, the, these two sides give us polar decomposition as e, e to the at x times the identity and e to the at y times at k. But we know from the polar decomposition theorem that these two decompositions must be the same. So in particular, at x must be equal to at y and at k must be equal to y. So y minus x must be in the center of g and this is zero because g is semi simple. So this finishes the proof. Okay, so the exponential map is a diffeomorphism and this has very important topological consequences. The main one being that M is always homeomorphic 
and diffeomorphic, but never isometric to the Euclidean space. So it's simply connected and non-compact. And since M is the quotient of G mod K, K must be connected because it's the quotient being simply connected. So we can go further and prove that K is maximum compact. So the proof of this theorem is usually done in an algebraic fashion, but I wanted to share with you a very short proof that simply uses the Cartan fixed point theorem for Hadamard manifolds. So let L be a compact subgroup containing K. The fact that we know that M is a Hadamard manifold allows us to use the Cartan fixed point theorem. So this one asserts that compact subgroups acting by isometries on Hadamard manifolds have fixed points. In this case, L is going to have a fixed point P, which is expressed as G dot O. So we have the chain of inclusions K contained in L contained in the isotropy of P. But since P is G O, we can express the isotropy as G K G minus one, all right? But because of this chain, we have exhibited K as being contained in a conjugate of itself. And since K is compact, this is only possible if these two last inclusions are equalities. So therefore, K is equal to G K G minus one, and it therefore must be equal to L, and thus proving maximality. All right, so <clears throat> now I wanted to go uh, to start to delve into the Iwasawa decomposition, which is a topic more, uh, which is a topic more in, uh, inside the one of semi-simple V groups. And therefore, I'm going to need a little bit of machinery from the theory of semi-simple V groups and the algebras, mainly the decomposition in the <clears throat> in root spaces, which if you have studied complex semi-simple V algebras, then this may seem, may seem sort of familiar to you. So the idea is to fix a maximal is to fix a maximal abelian subspace in P. Uh, one can show that maximal abelian subspaces are conjugate. So even though we're making a choice here, we know that they differ by an element of k. And since A is abelian and contained in P, the family at A must also be a commuting family of endomorphisms. And by the definition of our metric in G, these endomorphisms are symmetric. So from the, from the linear algebra results and simultaneous diagonalization, we know that G may be decomposed as the sum of the common eigenspaces of the elements of our A. So just to be more formal, we can consider the linear functionals on A, they are in the dual space A star, and for each functional lambda, we define the vector space G lambda as the set of all elements X in G, such that for every element of A, H, X is an eigenvector for at H with eigenvalue lambda H. So this is the, <clears throat> this is the common eigenspace. We call this the restricted root space or simply root space. And in the case that lambda is not zero and this G lambda is not the zero subspace, we say that lambda is a restricted root or simply a root. So what we get from simultaneous diagonalization is that G must decompose as the orthogonal direct sum of G zero with all the different G lambda where lambda is a root. In particular, the set of roots must be finite because G is a finite dimensional space. Okay, we're going to need some further properties of the root spaces. To, we need to see what the operations of bracketing and taking the Cartan involution does to root spaces. So if we have two root spaces G lambda and G mu, it turns out that their bracket is contained in G lambda plus mu. The computation is quite direct because if we take an element X in G lambda, a Y in G mu, and an H in A, then we compute at H of XY by using the Jacobian identity and recognizing on the right that the transformation, the elements YH and HX are controlled by X being in G lambda and Y being in G mu. So we substitute and we arrive at this expression being equal to lambda of h times xy plus mu of h times xy, or to be more precise, lambda plus mu evaluated at h at xy. And this is and this proves that the Lie bracket is in g lambda plus mu. So bracketing a uh, two vector <coughs> two root spaces takes a sort of space corresponding to the sum. And if we take the Cartan evolution, it will take our root space into the root space of the opposite root. So again, the proof is more or less direct. We take an element X in G lambda, an element H in A, then the bracket of H with theta X 
by using the theta is an involution must be theta of theta h comma x. Theta h is equal to minus h because a is contained in p. So we simply express it as minus theta of h x. But we know that h x is lambda of h times x because x is in the root space. So by rearranging, we get that theta x is again an eigenvector for add h with eigenvalue minus lambda h. The, <clears throat> the main consequence of this last equality, since theta is an isomorphism, is that if lambda is a root, then minus lambda is also a root. So the set of roots is invariant under multiplying by minus one. And now this last property might seem a little counterintuitive with respect to the complex case, because in the complex case, G0 is equal to the Cartan subalgebra, whatever that was. <laughs> but in this case, we're taking the maximal abelian subspace, and it's strictly smaller than G0. So we have that G0 is the direct sum of A with the centralizer of A in K. So now the proof is a little more, a little bit more involved. So we know that G0 is invariant under theta because of this expression in the second in the second line. And therefore, it can be decomposed as the sum of the eigenspaces of theta restricted to G0. So it's G0 intersect K plus G0 intersect P. So notice that the elements of G0 intersect K are the elements of K that commute with A. So they are precisely the elements of the centralizer. What we need to do now is to prove that G0 intersect P is precisely A. One inclusion is direct because the elements of A commute with themselves. So A must be in contained in P intersect G0. And conversely, if X is in this intersection, then the vector space A plus Rx must be an abelian subalgebra because X commutes with A. And since it contains A and A is maximal, this means that the sum is equal to A, so X is contained in A, and therefore the equality, <clears throat> we get the equality. So there are more properties of roots by studying the root pattern in the terms, <clears throat> by studying the root pattern and abstract systems, and there's, and there's a lot more theory to it. I will not talk about this in the next week, but for the Iwasawa decomposition, we're going to be fine with just these properties and just a, a little, just another notion. May I ask yeah. about the, so you, you said that this G zero must be strictly larger than A, or maybe I misheard it because yeah. I, didn't, I, I didn't think it's always the case, right? For SLM. Yeah, yeah no, that was a mistake on my part. I should have yeah. said that it's, I think, I think maybe, maybe larger. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I, I, think, part, I, I, I think it's, it's it's strictly larger than a mm, precisely when you have roots of multiplicity greater than one, but I'm not sure. No, no, I don't like that. I'm not sure. But yeah, thanks for the correction. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, you can have a uh, symmetric spaces of non-compact type uh, with uh, root spaces of Multiplicity. Oh, there isn't like a split wheel form for like PC and mm -hmm. that has has to have a, a equals G zero, I think. But oh. I'm not sure right now. Okay, okay, maybe. Sorry for being misleading then. Well, but but it's fine because now we stand corrected at least. Oops. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is to introduce a notion of positivity in the set of roots. So this is essentially taking a subset of delta, which we understand as positive root. And we don't really care about how we construct them as long as the sum of positive elements is positive. And if lambda is a root, then uh, either only lambda is a root and minus lambda is not a root, sorry, a positive root or the reverse. So minus lambda is positive and lambda is not positive. So there are different ways to do this. Uh, one of, these, one of which is using the method of regular elements. So we can consider the set uh, obtained by taking A and removing all the, all the kernels of the roots. And since this is a finite junior hyperplanes, it follows that the set must be open and dense in the vector space A. The elements of this space are known as regular elements. When we take a regular element H0 and we fix it, we know that 
for every element of delta lambda, lambda of H0 is going to be either strictly positive or strictly negative by definition. So we will say that lambda is positive if lambda of H0 is zero, is greater than zero, and negative if lambda of H0 is less than zero. So note that again, we have made that choice of a regular element and different regular elements may give rise to different positivity criteria. To be more precise, two regular elements are going to give the exact same criterion if and only if they lie on the same connected component of this set. The, those connected components are, used, are called bio chambers and they are <coughs> relevant in, the, in this theory. Right. But for us, this is enough. And we are now ready to understand uh, the Iwasawa decomposition and how it works. So let's turn back to our symmetric space of non-compact type, G mod K, and we make two choices. The first is a choice of a maximal abelian subspace A, and the second is a choice of a set of positive roots, delta plus. So now we take all the root spaces corresponding to positive roots, and we collect them in a vector subspace, which we call N. Okay. So the sum of two positive roots is, root, is a positive root, and this means that N must be a subalgebra of G. And it's also important because there is only a finite amount of roots. <clears throat> Furthermore, if, we, if you take the direct sum of A with N, this is also a subalgebra because A acts diagonally on each root space, right? Because of this, this is a subalgebra. The commutator of the subalgebra A plus N is equal to N, and so, since n is nilpotent, a plus n is solvable. Well, the Iwasawa decomposition theorem gives us a relationship between these subalgebras and the isotropy subalgebra. And it's precisely that they are all in direct sum. We have the, the, the Iwasawa decomposition theorem, which exposes G as the vector space direct sum of K, A, and N. It is not necessarily a Lie algebra sum because it is not true in general that K, A, or N are ideals of the Lie group G. Okay, so I wanted to <clears throat> to show you to show you the proof of the result, but just before this, I'm going to comment the key example, which is the analogy that you should have in mind when you want with roots. With roots, so the the example of the algebra in this setting is SLNR, the algebra of trace zero matrices. In this type, in this setting, we take the compact subalgebra K to the SON, and one choice of the maximal abelian subspace is going to be the set of diagonal matrices of trace zero. And again, under an appropriate positivity criterion, the vector, sp <coughs> the vector space N is going to be precisely the space of all strictly upper triangular matrices. So and the root space are going to be corresponding to each element of the triangle, so, so to speak. Okay. So if we have this example in mind, then the Iwasawa decomposition is more or less easy to prove. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing that one should note in proving this result is that A and N are already in direct sum. This is simply because A is contained in G0 and N is, is exhibited as the sum of uh, roots below, uh, root spaces belonging to positive roots. Also, remember that we had the decomposition of G0 as the sum of the centralizer of A in K and A. And now we we'll start proving that A plus N intersect K is zero. So take any element in this space, then because it's in a, a plus n, it must be written as the sum of an element in A with the sum of some root vectors belonging to positive root spaces. But now x is in k, so it must be equal to theta x. But how does theta act here? Theta must multiply the abelian part uh, by minus one because I is in P. And on the nilpotent part, it takes these root vectors and it carries them to root vectors in root spaces that correspond to negative roots, because theta reversed the role of the positive and negative roots. So because of this, the abelian part must be zero, the part in A, and the part in N must also be zero, because if, if that wasn't the case, we would have terms in the negative root spaces. So x is equal to zero, right? So, so far we know that K, A and N are in direct sum, and now we know we need to prove that G is precisely that direct sum, okay? So simply take an element of G, then <clears throat> I've simply drawn here a diagram representing the, the roots and the maximal abelian subalgebra, like in an analogy with the SLNR case. 
we have here the maximal variance of algebra A. Here we have some dots corresponding to positive roots, and here we have some dots corresponding to negative roots. But in any way, we, have, we take our element X, and by using the root space decomposition, as well as this decomposition for digit zero, we may write X as the sum of some element in K, some element in A, some element in the negative root spaces, and some elements in the in the positive root space. So, for example, these dots in purple would represent the <coughs> the root spaces in which x lambda is not zero. Right. So this sum uh, doesn't look that it's obviously contained in k plus a plus m because of this third term, the term involving negative root spaces. The thing is that if we apply the Cartan involution, we know that if it's going to reverse the picture. It's going to uh, let A be as it is, I will take the negative roots to positive roots. So this is what we do to the negative elements. So if we take the elements x lambda here and you write them as theta x lambda plus one minus theta x lambda, the theta x lambda are now in the positive root spaces because of the effect of theta. And now one minus theta is precisely, uh, well, not precisely, it's two times the projection of the Lie algebra G onto K, right? So these elements are going to fall into K, and by rearranging, we have written this sum as uh, this element X as the sum of an element in K plus an element in A plus another element in K because of one minus theta, and now an element in A. So this proves the uh, Wasawa decomposition theorem. So this is at the Lie algebra level, and now one may wonder if this fact that elements of the isometry algebra are expressed as some of a, <clears throat> an orthogonal part, a diagonal part, and a triangular part, if this can be extrapolated to the Lie group level. So it turns out that there is an analog for this result at the level of, of the groups. So we come back to our set to our original setting. We have our symmetric space. We make the two choices of A and delta plus. And now instead of working with the subalgebras, a n and a plus n, we will work with the connected subgroups generated by these three algebras. And we call them <clears throat> capital A, capital N, and capital A n. Well, the Iwasawa decomposition theorem at the Lie group level asserts firstly that these three groups are simply connected. A is abelian, n is nonpotent, and a n is solvable. And finally, the <coughs> the part that matters the most for us, the multiplication maps uh, that take k times a times n to n and a times n to a n are diffeomorphisms, right? So we indeed can factor the isometries of the manifold, the, an orthogonal part, a diagonal part, and an impotent part. And the abelian and impotent part and the diagonal and the impotent part represent a sort of upper triangular part, right? Now, the proof at the Lie group level is more involved, so I just want to give a very brief sketch of how it works. So essentially, the idea is to prove it for SLNR. So to take our key example and to convert it to the only example in a way. So first, you find a, a orthonormal basis of the Lie algebra, such that the matrices of at K are skew-symmetric, the matrices of at A are diagonal with real eigenvalues, and the elements of at n are upper triangular matrices with zeros in the diagonal, just like in the case of SLNR. So this is more or less simple to prove, to find this basis. And now, instead of starting to prove the Iwasawa decomposition for G, we prove it for the matrix group at G, which I call here G prime. And instead of working with K, A, and N, I, we work with their adjoint images, which I call K prime, A prime, N prime. So K prime consists of orthogonal matrices, A prime consists with, of diagonal matrices with positive entries, and then prime consists of upper triangular matrices with ones in the diagonal. So here, the theorem is easier to prove, is, is, <clears throat> is the sophisticated version of the gram schmidt theorem for invertible operators. And once we prove it for G prime, we try to lift it to G, and this is doable because the adjoint map that takes G to G prime is only a finite covering map. So by lifting the result, you get the decomposition at the Lie group, at the Lie group G, right? 
So just as the last application of this, this theorem, because I, that would work a lot too in, the, in a purely algebraic setting, and <coughs> symmetric space haven't been haven't taken a major role here. I wanted to end this presentation by talking a little bit about how we can use the Iwasawa decomposition to work with non-compact symmetric spaces. So the main idea is to take our space M and we take the Iwasawa decomposition G equals K A M. So we're going to drop the isotropy part. So we're going to forget about the isotropy group and we're going to let the solvable group A N act in B. Because we have removed the isotropy component, we know that the action is going to be transitive and free. So in particular, the map file that takes the elements of just I N and evaluates them at the origin is going to be an equivariant diffeomorphism. <coughs> so, so it's a diffeomorphism. And while A N is not necessarily a Riemannian manifold, we can simply take the pullback metric from M and disendows it with a Riemannian structure that is going to be left invariant because of the equivariance property of this map type. So this, pro this proves the following theorem, asserting that every symmetric space of non-compact type is isometric to a simply connected solvable D group with a left invariant metric. And this is what we call the solvable model for the manifold M. <clears throat> and some of the advantages of working with this model is that it's very easy to produce interesting submanifolds by taking subgroups A of A N and letting them act on M and viewing them in this in the setting of the solvable model. And, for, and lastly, simply I want to tell you that there are formulas here for the there are explicit expressions for the inner product on A N and <laughs> another expression for the Levi Civita connection of the group A N that are very really useful in order to make explicit computations. So well, that was everything that I wanted to talk to you, uh, to talk to you about. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, thanks, Arma. Thank you. That's a lovely picture. Thanks. The um, easiest one to make. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, well, I wanted uh, to say sorry uh, because I was mistaken early. Yeah. Oh, so, <laughs> the, so it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. true, right? The, there is no there is no k zero precisely when the roots are of multiplicity one, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. That's just so yeah. just so that we are, are on the same page. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. When uh, there's no k zero when when it yeah, is, I think uh, kind of the I, I think kind of form. yeah, I, I think kind of the conceptual context. reason for this is that in general, uh, k zero. So th th this part, what was it? It was the centralizer of A in K. Uh, if you take the corresponding connected Lie subgroup, then it acts adjointly on each restricted root space and its action is kind of like of cohomogeneity one. So it, map, it can map any direction in any other direction. So if it's zero, it means that the, every root subspace is one dimensional and then, then there's kind of the opposite statement as well. That's I think kind of how to remember it. Yeah. But, but yeah, thanks for confirming. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, does anyone have any other questions? Just a question in the chat. Yeah, cool. No, no, I think ah, it was no. just the it's, it's just a it's just a approval. <laughs> yeah, that it was correct.